Good morning from Lisbon and welcome to the launch of the European Drug Report 2024. Today we have around 400 people registered for the event, so thank you very much for joining us today. We know it's a particularly busy week for, for um, journalists this week. Uh, before we start with the speeches, I'd like to just give you a few practical details that you'll need throughout the event. Uh, should you run into any technical difficulties, there's a help desk button at the bottom left of your screen. Um, after the speeches, we'll have a question and answer session where you can um, ask your questions to the director. Um, and for that, please click on the agenda button at the top left of your screen and scroll down to questions and answers for journalists. Uh, today, the proceedings will be in English, so please write your questions in English. Um, so, to kick off uh, with the speeches, I have the pleasure and the honour to introduce the first of our three speakers today. We're delighted to have with us again European Commissioner for Home Affairs, Ms. Yilvo Johansson, who's joining us from Brussels. So, over to Brussels, please. Thank you. You've done it again. Thank you for an excellent drug report warning us that many new drugs are entering the market, often very pure and potent drugs. Increasingly, people in Europe are mixing drugs, taking potentially deadly cocktails of different kinds of drugs, like pink cocaine, a dangerous mix that changes every time you take it, including MDMA, cocaine, ketamine and more. Drugs have no labels or health warnings. People have no idea what they are taking. These mixes can make people very sick and even kill them. And it will be more difficult to save people if no one knows what they have actually taken. Criminals are constantly creating new drugs to avoid detection. At the drugs agency you are now monitoring over 950 different drugs. You are warning us of synthetic opioids, 81 new ones the last 15 years. Last year, especially netazine, highly potent and extremely deadly, causing death in Estonia and Latvia and poisoning in Ireland and France. Drug use is getting worse in Europe. Half a million people in the EU injected drugs last year. Traditionally heroin, but nowadays also other drugs like amphetamines and cocaine. At least 6,400 people died of an overdose. 20% of these involved cocaine. After cannabis, cocaine is the second most common drug used in the EU. Record quantities are being seized. 160 tons in Antwerp Harbour alone last year. But while seizures are up, purity remains high and prices are stable, showing that huge amounts of cocaine are available. With successful efforts in big ports to prevent criminal infiltration, traffickers are now moving to smaller ports to smuggle drugs. But we are tightening the net. We are improving cooperation with Latin American partner countries. And in January, I launched the European Ports Alliance, precisely to prevent criminals moving from port to port. And now, 31 European ports have joined, and the alliance is becoming operational. It takes a network to fight a network. The last four years, I put forward 25 initiatives and laws in the field of security. And one of those is the new and better mandate for you. In less than three weeks, you will start operating as the EU Drugs Agency. You will be able to examine the danger of drug mixing, polysubstance use, and how we can counter it. You will have a stronger analytical capacity thanks to a network of laboratories. You will be able to work more internationally with key partners like Colombia, Ecuador, you will be able to issue early warnings with the new European drug alert system and have the capacity to make health and security threat assessments. I am very proud of you, of what you have achieved so far, 
and I so much looking forward to witness what you will be capable of doing with your new resources and powers. I am delighted to soon be meeting you in Lisbon to celebrate with you the launch of the Drug Agency. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner, for your contribution and also for your kind words about our work. And we look forward to seeing you very soon in Lisbon. So next, uh, we go to Vienna and to hear from the chair of our management board, Dr. Franz Peach. Uh, Dr. Peach has been a member of our management board since 2002, and he joins us today from Vienna. He represents Austria on the board. Thank you. Today, DMCDDA launches its European Drug Report 2024. The report delivers the latest overview of drug situation in Europe up to 2023, based on data from 29 countries, the EU 27, Turkey and Norway. It explores long-term trends and emerging threats in the areas of drug use and supply and includes analysis on drug-related harms and treatment. As chair of the MCDD Management Board, I commend the high quality of this online publication. It offers innovative ways for audiences to explore and interact with the content, access underlying data and visualize its trends both at European and national level. This is the last European drug report published by the EMCDDA before it becomes the European Union's Drugs Agency, the EUDA, on 2nd of July 2024. Today, I look back over the years and at how the report has evolved. The first annual report on the state of the drugs problem in Europe was published in 1996 and aimed to cover the drugs problem in all its dimensions. With the shift to the European drug report in 2013, the emphasis was placed on new trends and developments. Over time, the MCDDA has also adapted its reporting methods to keep pace with the rapidly changing drug landscape, various EU enlargements and evolving information needs in the areas of policy and practice. The agency has provided immense value to its stakeholders by offering an objective assessment of drug-related issues across Europe, coupled with in-depth analysis and discussions on effective interventions. The launch of the European Drug Report 2024 comes at a very special moment, as the agency embarks on a new phase of its history. I am convinced that the UDA will provide even more added value in helping European and national policymakers and professionals working in the drugs fields to tackle the causes and consequences of drug use. I will be very pleased to chair the first meeting of the EUDA Management Board on the 4th and 5th of July in Lisbon. I would like to convey my special thanks to the director and to all of his staff for his insightful report and for the EMCDDA's many years of comprehensive reporting on the drug situation in Europe. My sincere thanks also go to the national focal points, to the EMCDDA Scientific Committee and all of national and European and international partners who contributed to this analysis. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Peach. And we also look forward to seeing you very soon in Lisbon for the next management board meeting. Uh, so now it's time to give the floor to our director, Alexi Guzdale, who will present the key findings and his reflections on the report. Over to you, Alexi. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Dr. Peach. Hello, everyone. It's a real pleasure for me to present you the 29th annual report of the agency before the big change that will happen in July for all of us. This report is a, a full package uh, containing statistics, analysis that you can find on our website. And this would have not been possible without the huge efforts and the contribution of all the 108 persons living and working at the MCDDA in Lisbon but also the network of the national focal points that gathers 250, 280 professionals working in those national drug observatories in all EU member states, in Norway and in Turkey, and also all the networks of experts that are working with us and that make our agency so unique in Europe. What we are going to present you today are the most recent trends what, is the, what are the recent developments about the situation? And even more important, what are we trying to do to address and to cope with this problem? 
The first outline of the situation is described with three words, everywhere, everything, everyone. Stressing that drugs today are, are everywhere. We never had so many drugs available or produced on the territory of the EU. Everything can be the object of uh, addictive behavior today, including substances no one, no one would imagine ever human beings would use them. And then everyone can uh, be experiencing personally or indirectly an addictive episode, whether acute or chronic. So let's see together a bit more in details what are those recent developments. Talking about drugs are everywhere, what we see, and the Commissioner highlighted the fact that we have an increase still in the quantities and the variety of drugs that have been seized on the EU territory, with in 2022, 323 tons of cocaine that have been seized in the European port. But we have also an increase in the production of drugs, whether they are synthetic drugs, for which Europe is uh, becoming a global exporter, such as for MDMA or ecstasy. But also, increasingly, we produce amphetamines, methamphetamines. And more recently, in the recent years, we have seen the appearance of laboratories that are being used to transform uh, cocaine pasta, cocaine base, into uh, chlorhydrate de cocaine. So uh, those are very important changes for which today it's also important to better moni monitor the trafficking, the diversion of the chemical precursors. As the Commissioner mentioned, we also identified new drivers for the drug market in Europe, uh, the, the organized criminal groups uh, making increasing use of the uh, uh, normal commercial supply chain uh, with a, a lot of attempts to corrupt uh, professionals, judges, uh, decision makers, and with uh, an increase in, the, in those uh, problems that I've seen almost everywhere in Europe. And not only that, what we see is today drug problem, the drug trafficking and drug seizures are happening in almost all ports in Europe, not only in the big ones. And those who are not yet facing a problem of the size or the importance of Rotterdam or Antwerp or Marseille or Le Havre know that uh, one day their time may come. That's important to realize that it's not the problem of the other, it's our joint problem. And therefore, the importance of the response presented by the Commission when it proposes a roadmap for the fight against drug trafficking and a closer and stronger cooperation between European ports and ports, for instance, in Latin America. If we look at everything, what does it mean today? Today, we see a broad uh, size, uh, a broad uh, panorama of substances that are being used. Of course, we have the traditional ones, the old drugs, but we have also plenty of new substances uh, that uh, nobody, as I said, would uh, imagine that some human beings could use them. Some of them are products for uh, veterinary medicine, for instance. Altogether, uh, this, this, uh, this is uh, highlighted by the fact that today the key word is polysubstance use, and in many cases we observe more mis-selling of drugs, mis-selling, mis meaning that uh, you have people who are supposed to think they buy a substance, and in fact the, what, they, what they are consuming is something else, are uh, different mixes. What we also uh, uh, observe is that uh, there are changes in the patterns of drug use and injecting drug use has not disappeared. A lot of people imagine that because heroin use uh, by injection has been reduced and is more or less stabilized, that injection of drugs is not a problem. This is not true. This is not exact. New substances are being used for different practices, including in some cases chemsex. We have also uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, new, new risks, new substances appearing, and for that, uh, what is extremely important, uh, and the Commissioner mentioned this, is to have a stronger capacity to detect, identify the substances, but also uh, to be able to inform uh, the, the actors from the field, the hospitals, uh, about the toxicity, the antidote, and the measures that can be taken. This will be part of the new mission of the new agency. Let's move now to everyone. 
The fact that there, is, there are so much substances and that they are so available in Europe uh, means that, of course, there is a huge, a big pressure from the market on the potential or existing users. So the key driver of the market, the key responsible for the dynamism of the market is the availability. So uh, the impact is observe, can be observed in the sense that there, is a, the, there are the first signs that there is a visibility and impact in terms of public health, of the availability of cocaine. But we know that there is a latency period between the moment when someone starts using cocaine for recreational purpose and then may face personal difficulties or health problems and then starts and uh, tries to enter into treatment, they can, it can take up to five or six or seven years. So we can uh, foresee that uh, the, the main impact in terms of needs for treatment that are caused by this increase in cocaine use will only be observed uh, in, in a few years from now. So we need also to be prepared for uh, answering, addressing those needs. On the other hand, as injecting behaviors and the sexual behaviors are changing and more substances are being used for that purpose, we have seen here and there in Europe an increase in HIV uh, drug-related uh, infections. So that's another element that uh, uh, requires our vig vigilance. And of course, uh, what we see at the same time, uh, an, a different impact and stronger impact on the population is both the increase in drug-related violence, but also the involvement of minors that are attracted in criminal uh, activities that are associated to drug use. And for instance, last year, there have been a few cases that were related in many member states of young people that were recruited just to be observers, to, to take a role uh, to, uh, at the level of the places where the deal is, take, is taking place. And in some cases, like in Marseille in September, a young guy started his new position, uh, his new job in the early afternoon. He was dead the evening because of a, a, a fight between the different groups. So we need to address. So the responses for that are both improving and strengthening, developing better evidence-based prevention. And the EMCDDA and the new agency have a program and will develop additional uh, standards and online training for professionals, you, uh, promoting the European prevention curriculum, for instance. We need also strengthen the crime prevention and also uh, develop uh, activities to install and promote what we call harm reduction systems. Instead of focusing on some specific responses, making sure that we are ready to address the problem. And end of November, we are going to organize in Brussels the first European conference on drug-related violence to see not only the size and the dimension of the problem, but to identify innovative initiatives that uh, allow to try to address the problem and protect uh, not only the citizens, but our communities. So in that sense, not only we need to support instead of punish, but we need also to support the cities and the local communities. Finally, uh, we have a lot of questions in the report uh, about uh, and around cannabis that has transformed itself into a specific policy topic. Why? Because on the one hand, uh, we, we observe a, a huge variety, diversity, complexity in the, in the understanding of uh, what are the needs for treatment what kind of treatment is working. So we need better studies, better research. And also it's partly associated to the fact that the concentration of cannabis in THC, that is the main substance, the main cannabinoid that is having the psychoactive impact, this concentration has doubled in the last 10 years. So it has impact and it represents a risk for health. At the same time, we see there are changes in the market, different products being sold that in some cases can potentially increase the risk for the consumers, but also for children. Uh, if we think about the gummies that are circulating in some cities in Europe, so we need to address this. And uh, two other very important points. First, 
In five EU member states, there have been new legislative decisions, initiatives uh, to allow under certain conditions for the recreative use of cannabis. And this requires uh, certainly monitoring and evaluation and the EMCDDA is uh, closely working with the member states who have taken those new legislation uh, to identify criteria for the evaluation. Research evaluation will help us understand in the coming years what has been, what is and what has been the impact of those new measures. And then finally, talking about cannabis, uh, we know that many member states in the European Union and have adopted the legislation allowing for uh, production of cannabis for medical use and use of cannabinoids for medical purpose. Uh, the commercial part in many countries is more developed than the medical one, and many countries need uh, guidelines, need uh, training, need education for the professionals. But there have been, in the recent years, very interesting and positive results of uh, studies, experimentation, such as in France, for instance. Now, last point, last or maybe new, uh, uh, new danger uh, uh, that is coming. In Afghanistan, since last year, the government has declared a ban on the production of opium poppy. And uh, all the information available, including the analysis of satellite imaging, shows that uh, this ban is implemented around 95, 98%. So what can happen? What we know is that uh, in most of the cases, there are still stocks available either in Afghanistan or along the heroin route. So uh, we still uh, can expect that it will take sometimes a few months before we can observe on the field a uh, drought of heroin on the drug market in Europe. But there are some signs already in some EU member states or in the UK where there is an important decrease that has been observed in the seizures of heroin, which may indicate that uh, the impact and the heroin drought is coming progressively and will be existing de facto soon in Europe. So the question is, what will happen next and what are the risks for us? Well, the main risk, and uh, this is why there is a, a global alliance against synthetic drugs that was launched by the US, by the State Secretary Blinken last year in July. All EU member states, the EU institutions and our agency are participating, contributing to, to uh, prevent uh, the further spread of the use of synthetic drugs, especially synthetic opioids. The risk indeed is uh, people, those who are using heroin, uh, because of the drought, may uh, switch their use towards drugs that are cheaper, easily produced, and extremely more dangerous than heroin, and the uh, uh, opioids of vegetal origin, which are the synthetic opioids. Some of them, they can be up to 700 times more potent than morphine. And we see already that in the US, Every year you have uh, between 100,000 and 130,000 of people who die yearly from overdose from opioid, and about half of them at least are caused by some of those synthetic opioids. So there is a risk. This will probably happen. What is the dimension of the, the new risk? What are the substances that people are going to use? We don't know yet. There was such a, a similar experience 20 years ago under the first government of the Taliban. And what we have seen is that the behavior of the users was different from one country in the EU and another. So we need to remain vigilant. So what we need to do is uh, to be prepared. And the new mandate of the new agency, our new agency, is about contributing to EU preparedness. And in that sense, we are going to launch a preparedness advisory uh, in July uh, to encourage the member states to maintain the offer for treatment, to adapt the harm reduction services that are essential for addressing any emerging crisis associated to synthetic drugs, in particular the synthetic opioids. We need to encourage member states that have not yet adopted a legislation for the use of an antidote that is called naloxone 
to do so without any delay. But what we know is that the use and the prescription and the guidelines for uh, the, the use of naloxone need also to be adapted and that uh, some of those substances being much more powerful than uh, heroin, more potent, uh, it may require a change in the standard national guidelines for the administration of naloxone to save lives. So the objective is to be ready, prepared in the case there is an epidemic to save lives. Finally, this is what will be the new mandate, the new scope of our activities. Becoming a monitoring center, we started 30 years ago, and now with the new mission, we have a more clear role about helping to save lives, helping to protect the citizens through better capacity of the EU to anticipate, which means learning from what has happened so far, but anticipating on the future, a stronger alert mechanism, better responses and support to the member states to adopt, if needed in emergency, new and complementary responses. And finally, to learn from the experience, from the new lessons from the practice, to ensure that the new best practice is transmitted to the national curriculum to train the, the professionals. So with the new mandate, the new agency, together we can even better protect all citizens and people who are using drugs. And for that, and for more information about that, uh, I invite you to join us on the 3rd of July, together with Commissioner Johansson for the press conference here in Lisbon for the inauguration of the European Union Drugs Agency, EUDA. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Alexi. Um, so now we're going to open the session for questions and answers. So I'll just walk, walk you through the instructions again. I'll just repeat what I, I said in the introduction. Um, so if you click at the on the top left of your screen, you have the agenda item. So if you uh, click on that button, you'll see questions and answers for journalists and click on that and you'll be able to ask your question. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, please put your questions in English and um, state your name and your media organization. So I'm just going to see what questions we've got coming in. Okay. So I'm just going to read the first one. So the first one is from Inda Bugarin, who is a Mexican journalist. Uh, good morning and thank you for the invitation. For the first time, European cocaine seizures exceed those made by the United States. We know that Mexican cartels play a leading role in cocaine trafficking. What role do Mexican cartels play in cocaine trafficking to Europe? Considering that cocaine shipments to Europe are increasing, what can be expected from the Mexican cartels in relation to the European market? Would you like me to repeat? Or, no, no, yeah, that's okay. okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, happy to, to receive your question. Uh, it's uh, one of our more uh, uh, permanent and reliable partners following each of our press uh, conference. Well, uh, what I can say regarding the, the drug trafficking and the seizures is that indeed uh, we have, uh, uh, we have a, a permanent and continuous increase in the seizures of cocaine in Europe including also an increase in the seizures in the ports uh, uh, of origin or in the places like in Western Africa that uh, serve sometimes on the way uh, on the cocaine route to the EU. But those routes are changing. So uh, what, what we don't know for the moment in detail is what is the proportion of uh, which criminal organization involved in drug trafficking. What we know is that while until five, six years ago, uh, uh, there was a huge flow of cocaine that was coming from some Brazilian ports. Today, uh, the flow of cocaine coming from Colombia is either coming from some port of Colombia, but especially from, uh, from Ecuador. And hence, as the commissioner mentioned, uh, the decision uh, from the commission to encourage those countries to have a bilateral cooperation agreement with the MCDDA. 
Uh, I was in uh, Colombia a few weeks ago with my team to sign an agreement uh, with Colombia. We signed the same agreement with Peru last year in, and, and I was there in October. And uh, on the 3rd of July, in presence of the commissioner, when we will inaugurate the new EUDA, uh, we will also sign a bilateral agreement of cooperation with Ecuador. What is clear is that uh, uh, all, all criminal organizations, uh, including the Mexican cartels, are involved in all those activities. But not only, we also have observed that uh, uh, Mexican cartels directly or indirectly are playing a role in the increase of the production uh, of some of the drugs on the territory of the EU. So we continue to monitor this, uh, this situation together with uh, our sister agency, Europol, who has presented a very important and useful report uh, a few weeks ago about uh, the main uh, criminal organizations that are active on the territory of the EU. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question, as the EUDA, uh, this, so this is from Christina Wallin, and she, she works for a Swedish um, uh, um, drug specialized um, magazine. Um, she says, as the EUDA, how do you think you will participate in the work against organized crime groups and their drug affairs? Well, we, all get, we already uh, participate in some of those groups. We, we attend uh, on, on, the, on the ad hoc basis, for instance, uh, the, the meeting or some of the meetings of the Standing com uh, Committee on Internal Security, COSI, uh, from the Council of the EU. So certainly we are going to continue this participation. We are also uh, working closely together with Europol uh, for impact. And, uh, and we make a key contribution to the work uh, on impact that is, uh, 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 that is related to drugs and drug trafficking. So in the future, we are going to continue that. And already last year, we already put into practice the new mandate, even before it is officially the case. For instance, because the European Commission invited us to contribute and to participate in the Schengen evaluation uh, in the ports of uh, Rotterdam, Amsterdam, uh, Hamburg and Marseille. So this, this is a work in progress. Uh, the work uh, on that side uh, of our, our four mandate uh, will be uh, further developed in the coming two years. But this is only part of our mandate. A lot of people are wondering if we are becoming a, harm, a law enforcement institution. No, not only, we are continue to develop at the same time the activities in the area of public health. Thank you. Uh, next question. So, uh, Alexei, you noted the new trend of polysubstance use. Uh, with different mixes and people often thinking they're buying a substance, but in fact, they're going to consume something else. Does this bring new challenges in harm reduction? And this is from Dependencias magazine, Anten Antonio Silva. Okay, thank you, Antonio. Another very good and important question. Uh, yes, uh, polydrug use and, uh, and mis what we call mis-selling, which is the fact that people frequently I think they are buying a substance that at the end is not the one uh, they, they thought it was. And the commissioner mentioned, for instance, pink cocaine that uh, by definition, contrarily to the name, doesn't contain any cocaine in it. Uh, and the content may change from one place, uh, from one moment to another. I think uh, it's, uh, it's uh, bringing new challenges, not only for harm reduction, but also for national or local policies especially at the city level. We had uh, uh, the privilege to be invited to participate in the uh, conference of the European Forum on, uh, uh, on the urban security in Brussels in March. And this was one of the topics that have been discussed. I think those changes, first, uh, they have two consequences, at least. The first one is we need to change the way we look at prevention because many of our programs of the old way of looking at things are still designed having in mind the heroin epidemic model. And this has to change because of those substances, because of the multiplicity of substances, but also the multiplicity of risk behavior. And the second element is that we need to move from a discussion about some specific harm reduction 
services or modes of intervention towards the concept of harm reduction systems. Because uh, having a, a, a drug consumption room or having a drug checking program is of course extremely useful for many reasons, even more today than before, but it's only part of the response. And we cannot expect from those programs that only by adopting them, implementing them and financing them, we will significantly help to reduce the risk for the population, not only for some of the users. So for me, that's the biggest challenge we have in front of us. Thank you. Um, so the next question comes from Cormac O'Keefe, and he's from the Irish Examiner. He has two questions, so I'll, I'll take the first one uh, first. So is there any information to suggest that organized crime groups are examining the production of nitazines in Europe? And the second. And the second one. Um, on the smaller ports being targeted in the trafficking of cocaine, the report mentions Nordic countries, but are ports on the west coast of Europe, such as in Ireland, France and Portugal, also potential targets? Okay, thank you. So, uh, yes, first of all, uh, it's it's a bit premature to to have uh, to make to draw conclusions about what is happening with the production of nitazines in Europe. What we know for the moment is uh, nitazines are coming either from China or India. Uh, we don't have for the moment uh, notifications of a huge number of laboratories uh, that have been uh, dismantled on the EU territory where it was uh, with the purpose to produce nitazines. Um, the, I would say that the, the trend about nitazines is relatively recent on the territory of the EU, but there are important alerts. And uh, as you are from Ireland, you certainly know that uh, in March, uh, for the first time, there were some uh, overdoses uh, in, in Irish prisons where nitazines have been discovered. Uh, and, and this is extremely important and interesting. First, because it shows that when I speak about preparedness, and uh, this is what we are going to present and to develop more in details in July at the time of the launch of the new agency and the first constitutive management board meeting, in which for the first time we are going to invite for a specific session to discuss the drug situation, the partner countries that are not members of the EU or not yet. Um, the, the situation here shows that first, we need emergency plans everywhere in Europe, and we are not yet there for the moment. We need, we need to combine the, the information, uh, including about what is available in the prisons. We need to make sure that uh, we articulate with the capacity for forensic and toxicology laboratories to detect and then to, to also identify and adjust what are the measures that are required, uh, for instance, to deliver an antidote and to understand what the change of substances implies in terms of uh, need to change those guidelines. But we see that, for instance, the situation in the UK is much more problematic than in the, re in the EU for the moment, and certainly it has an impact uh, on the situation in Ireland. So we, we as I said, we, we don't know yet if there is a capacity, a, at least a strong or established capacity for production in Europe. But the fact that uh, there is an increase in the availability and the episodes of overdose or intoxication, certainly we need to raise the level to be ready uh, to act uh, if, if needed. Uh, as far as the question on the ports is concerned, uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Because indeed, we mentioned, especially in the commentary, the main, the biggest ports, and of course, what is today the, still the, the first port more visible is Antwerp. And from time to time, we receive questions from journalists, ah, but what's happening in Belgium? We need to do that's something that's really terrible. It's true, but the EU is working together it has not always been the case. We speak about Belgium, we speak about Rotterdam today, but when Spain six years ago was ensuring more than 50% of the cocaine seizures for all Europe, most of the countries that were not Spain did not really pay attention because it was a bit like that is the problem of the others. What has changed today, and this has been one of the key roles of the Commissioner Johansson, 
and the Belgian presidency of the EU with Minister Annelies Verlinden, the Belgian Minister of Interior, is to bring together, to push the member states to realize that that's a problem we have in common. All the ports, and this means also that this is the interest of the European Alliance private public, because there is no way in which the, the different member states at political level can have an impact if we cannot bring together into a specific new innovative partnership uh, the, the private sector that is managing those ports. And when there was the launch of this, uh, this European alliance in Antwerp, uh, I can tell you that uh, every, every day almost there were new ports that were learning about the initiative and some of them having already a problem, the others knowing that uh, if they don't have yet, they will have soon. And they, they are all volunteers, they are all sharing the same worries and they want to act. But we have already some not so small ports, but for instance, Le Havre, uh, they are already for years, some years, that uh, there is a problem with, uh, with cocaine trafficking and, and it's moving. So certainly today, uh, and if you look uh, uh, in detail in the, in the, uh, on the website, not only on the commentary, but all the elements that together constitute the report, you will see that this phenomenon is uh, increasing and potentially it touches all countries and all ports. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next question comes from Luxembourg and it comes from Joelle Adami of Vox. She says, um, there has been much discussion about synthetic cannabinoids in recent years and there's a sense that new substances are constantly coming onto the market without consumers being aware of their actual composition or effects. What are your observations here? Wouldn't the legalization of recreational cannabis be healthier for everyone in the long term? Thank you for the question. I think we, we talk about two different uh, issues because uh, the development of uh, synthetic drugs and synthetic cannabinoids uh, is not necessarily related to the consumption of cannabis, knowing also that uh, there, are, there are different substances and that there are different uses. Uh, but you are totally right. Uh, in saying that, uh, as I mentioned, mis-selling, uh, there is a huge risk in the fact that people are, uh, in many cases, they are buying uh, drugs, including cannabis, without knowing, for instance, they contain synthetic cannabinoids. And, and this is one of the features, this is one of the new missions of the new agency that are extremely important for me. Because we speak about uh, uh, this issue for the last four or five years at least. For instance, talking about hemp that is uh, uh, without a strong content in THC, but that is sprayed uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with synthetic cannabinoids. People don't know. They believe they consume or they smoke cannabis and in fact they consume uh, synthetic cannabinoids. But even more important, the clinicians in the emergency wards, in the intensive care unit, they don't have the, in the information. They don't know what is the antidote. They don't know what they have to do, what they can to do, that what they can do. And this is one of the things that will change with the new mandate. Uh, what we see is that uh, whatever the options outside the EU, the, whatever independently from the policy decisions to allow uh, or to legalize recreational use of cannabis, uh, the problem associated to the synthetic cannabinoids has not disappeared. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, as I said, what is extremely important is first is to, to be clear and to be as much evidence based as possible on what are the objectives of those uh, policy changes regarding the legalization of or the tolerance of uh, the uh, recreational use of cannabis in Europe and to put in place uh, the system, the research, the evaluation mechanism that will allow us to understand better how does it work, what are the positive effects and what are the negative effects. And uh, to serve that work, that is uh, already something we do and we provide su technical and scientific support to those member states. Uh, I will pay an official visit to Canada in September uh, to learn in detail from the results of the evaluation that was conducted by the Canadian authorities because Canada has a very strong 
track record in the evaluation of public policies, including in public health or mental health. And therefore, I think uh, we have better chances to have uh, the real results of a serious evaluation that will not pretend that everything is successful, but that will help us to understand what works, what are the unexpected good results, but what are also the potential unexpected problems that have been maybe caused by the new policy. And this is what we are going to continue to follow uh, together with the member states who adopted those legislative changes in the coming years. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is from Germany, from Süddeutsche Zeitung, and it comes from Rainer Stadler, and he asks, uh, can you tell us, or what can you tell us about the new substance fentanyl, which is playing such a devastating role in the US? Thank you for your question. Fentanyl is not new for us in Europe. Fentanyl, uh, the, first of all, fentanyl is a medicine. It was uh, created by Janssen Pharmaceutica, a Belgian pharmaceutical or former Belgian pharmaceutical company, when the objective was to find a medicine that was stronger for extremely acute pain, that morphine was not enough, did not succeed to cover, and also as an anesthetic. So, first of all, fentanyl has also a legal existence. Second, through the early warning system on new psychoactive substances that we are running for 27 years, and that is a unique system in the world with a permanent monitoring 24-7, and that led, as the Commissioner Johansson said, to the discovery over the last 27 years of more than 950 new substances that never had appeared before on the European drug market. The fentanyl, the first one was discovered 12 years ago in Estonia. This was the first alert. And since then, we have uh, uh, plenty of uh, uh, synthetic opioids, including fentanyl that have appeared uh, on the European drug market. But the truth is the recent years, uh, the last uh, three, four years, the number of new uh, fentanyl, the new molecules that belong to that family, uh, has decreased. There were only one or two uh, last year, uh, the, no, uh, the year before. Uh, and last year, out of the seven new uh, synthetic opioids that were discovered on the European drug market, there were six nitazines and there was only one fentanyl. So what does it mean and what can we say? Well, the first thing we can say is the epidemic with fentanyl in the US had, has different root causes. This is one of the things I had the opportunity to mention when we, part we were invited to participate in the launch of the Global Alliance Against Synthetic Drugs. So does it mean that uh, we will not face any problem with fentanyl? No, certainly. The potential risk, and this is why I mentioned at the end of my presentation, the new potential risk that is directly or indirectly can be the consequence of the ban, the ban on the production of uh, poppy in Afghanistan is that one. But the situation in the EU is different. First, today we don't see so much the fentanyl, we see more nitazines. And some of them are equally or even more potent uh, than uh, some of the fentanyl, so certainly the risk is still high. And this is why uh, we want to launch a first prepar uh, preparedness advisory in July to call the member states to assess the state of preparedness and to provide them help if needed. But what will be the precise group of, of substances that will replace heroin in Europe is very difficult to say. Uh, as I said, for the moment there are others, uh, but also 20 years ago, what we have observed is that in a country like Hungary, heroin users, because there was no heroin available, instead of using other kinds of opioids, they moved, they shifted to the use by injection of stimulants, cathinones. And what is even more surprising is that when heroin was back on the market, they sticked to the consumption of cathinones, uh, which, which illustrates just that human behavior is everything but rational. So we need to be prepared and we need to make sure that we don't prepare ourselves only for one substance or one subgroup of substances because the problem can arrive. 
maybe all over Europe or in some countries more than others with other group of substance. And this is why we need to support and to make use of the, of the opportunity offered by drug checking and by drug consumption room and by strengthened capacity for toxicology and forensic laboratories to detect in real time. And for instance, this is why we are supporting a project we developed the recent years that is called ESCAPE, in which we, we analyze the residues in the syringes. Because if we want to be ready, the first thing we know we need is to know as soon as possible what is circulating. So that's the point. And if it is, uh, nalog if it is uh, fentanyl or if it is nitazines or other substances, we can be ready provided that uh, we, we keep and we strengthen the range of services and interventions we have in the member states. Okay, uh, the next question comes from the Brussels Times um, from Chiara Carolan. Um, and she says, how does the EUDA plan to tackle the port of Antwerp in Belgium and other entry points for drugs into Europe? Thank you, Chiara. Well, uh, we are not uh, planning ourselves to tackle the problem in the, in the port of Antwerp, but we are providing all support uh, uh, also not only to Belgian authorities and to the Belgian presidency of the EU, but to the Commission. There are different uh, actions. Uh, I was referring to the roadmap, uh, but for the fight against drug trafficking that was uh, presented by the Commission and the Commissioner last year. Uh, but there are some specific actions. Working group between the ports in Europe, a specific working group between ports in Europe and ports in Latin America, with an increased interest from some ports in Latin America to be associated and to establish a closer and stronger cooperation. Uh, but there are also other initiatives such as the European Alliance. And I was mentioning and referring to the evaluation that was conducted by the Commission of Schengen as far as the ports are concerned. And the Commission has presented recently the conclusion of that evaluation. And we will continue to be involved as EUDA in the monitoring of the implementation of those measures, probably some new tasks uh, that will be asked to us. And this is part of the things we are going to explore and develop uh, over the coming months. Maybe at the time of the launch of the new agency in July, together with the commissioner, we will know already a bit more about this specific issue. Thank you. Um, I have a question here from Belgium, from uh, VRT, um, from Dries Hiru who says, um, so your, your report gives co cocaine seizures for 2022. Uh, do you have the total amount of tons of cocaine seized for 2023 and the intake in the port of Antwerp? Um, and how many drugs were detected? Okay, thank you, Dries. Uh, very good question. Uh, we don't have yet the data from all EU member states because in principle, those data on seizures, we received them every year when they've been validated and checked by the member states. We receive them every year in September, but we already have the data for the port of Antwerp, which is 116 tons. This was mentioned by Commissioner Johansson, and I think it has been mentioned previously by Minister uh, Verlinden. So, um, what, what we know is that for, for last year, uh, the last two years actually, there is a slight decrease in the number of new substances that have been discovered on the European drug market. I think for last year there were 26 or 27. So it's more or less one substance every 